thank you, Rohini, for joining us today. And uh, for the audience, Rohini Nalakini doesn't need any introduction as such. Uh, I'm just attempting to talk about Rohini uh, in, in a very small way, which is about her philanthropy work, which she has been doing for a very, very long time. She's very passionate about nature and wildlife. She does spend a lot of time in nature uh, and obviously in the outdoor itself. So this chat, which we are going to have with Rohini today is about her journey with the nature and the work, what she has done it with regard to the nature and its conservation. So I will uh, ask Kalyan to start off the session and then we will continue. So thank you, Rohit. Thank you, Kalyan. It's an honor to be here with like-minded people. Thank you for the opportunity. Great to have you, Rohini. So, um, uh, you know, like I said, Rohini doesn't need much introduction, but Rohini, I mean, you've been, uh, we'll get to a little bit of details and a lot of people know about uh, your foundation and, and the work that you do. Uh, a big part of what you do is related to environment and uh, conservation. So I would like to know, where did your first love for environment and nature start? I mean, uh, was it uh, decades ago? Was it more recent? And what made you focus your efforts towards environment? Okay, thank you. So I think, see, I was born and brought up in Mumbai. So there was, it was a, you know, though I was, uh, I was born in 59. So the 60s were when my childhood was, and it was very urban. And in those days, Mumbai didn't have much, I mean, uh, even though it was not as dense as it is now, even then we didn't have too much wildlife or anything. And inside my house, my parents uh, would get rid of any potential wildlife. They used to take these flipped cans and they used to, you know, kill every cockroach, ant and spider. So <laughs> between the lack of, however, my childhood, all our holidays were spent in my grandparents' farm in Dahanu, which is just uh, north of Mumbai on the coast in among the chikku orchards and the mango orchards. And there I got to experience a lot of nature. And I remember we used to, in those days, no seat belts, no nothing. We used to go in those open Jeeps and it was quite f f densely forested all around. So uh, those, I think that's where I began to understand how much and lying under the stars at night, my God, just a canopy of stars. We used to sleep outdoors. That's when I think I learned to not just love nature, but understand its relevance to human well-being, even as a child. So that's how it all began. And then, of course, as I started my philanthropy, as a journalist, I did some writing on the environment because Bombay was always tussling with environmental issues. So as a reporter for Bombay magazine, I got to cover some of that. And then uh, as I started doing my philanthropy and as I got involved with organizations like ATRI, of course, I went much deeper into issues of biodiversity, conservation, ecology, and all the many challenges therein for India and the world. And climate change, of course, has made everyone now an expert on all things to do with the environment. So that's a short history of my journey into this. Great. And, and one thing that both and me have seen you firsthand is uh, your search for the Black Panther. And, and uh, I was fortunate to be there when you saw your first Black Panther a couple of weeks ago. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, tell us and we saw your talk, uh, your passionate talk about the Black Panther. So how is it seeing the Black Panther in person and uh, in some sense the legend of the forest? Yeah, I mean, after five years, uh, I got a call. He's there, you just come, which I'd heard many times before and nothing had happened. So I was 100% sure as soon as I reached the bend, Blackie is going to come down and disappear. <laughs> but this time he decided not to. And actually what saved, uh, saved me from one more disappointment was a tiger that was in the bushes on the right. So Blackie didn't want to come down. And so I finally got to see him. And I must say it was quite a moment for me. And uh, yeah, a little bit of Hindi film type tears came to my eyes. <laughs> And then I just, I just said, oh, thank you. He really is so gorgeous. <laughs> so then I spent, you spent the five with... years, five years looking for the Black Panther. Well, not all five years, but every yeah. time we went in the forest, we would look. And the last, uh, this last year, 2020 was an intense search for Blackie. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, but he finally revealed himself to me only after I made a public confessional of my love. <laughs> <laughs> He was waiting for that. <laughs> it was Which is your favorite wildlife uh, sanctuary or a park as such? Or where you like no, to right go now, often? Because 
yeah i mean obviously india is so blessed so blessed right you go to sikkim you go to kaziranga you i haven't been to madhya pradesh properly but you go to ranthambore you go to all the rajasthan stuff uh even in maharashtra tadu ba wherever i mean then you go south india i mean in tamil nadu you go to vainad you go to so so many places in kerala tamil nadu um but uh, this, well my favorite forest right now is kabini i think it's really rocking it has the best wildlife you know you, you you turn a corner and there's a tiger the trees are amazing to understand and yeah it's kabini number 1 awesome so in in your uh, bangalore lit festival talk you spoke about the focus has to be on lesser known species and you know wide range of conservation which is required to be done how do you see that happening because most of the people are very focused on talking about the large mammals and the conservation yeah. effort also is on the large mammals and lesser yes. known species or the small species are mostly uh, ignored or not been spoken about it yeah so would like you to have some views from your side yeah i think it's the responsibility of all of us who care about nature who care about wildlife who care about what's going to happen how are human beings going to learn to live well on this planet i think it's our responsibility to introduce especially young people and especially urban people young urban people is the first category i would think of where we also get them as excited about seeing a draco or those amazing frogs or even spiders you know i found a by the way a tarantula in my room the other day uh, in uh, in i won't say where but in kabini and if uh, you know the old rohini when i said mm! but i understood that that tarantula also has a role to play so we gently took him out and put him outside no, but so it's up to us to spread the story of that interconnectedness that a tiger can't survive without everything and how is if we don't tell those stories well then obviously is the charismatic big large golden tigers that are going to capture attention but the better we tell our stories i think the faster this will change so talking right? about lesson on species rony like one of the earlier work that you've done actually from what i've known you a decade ago your focus was more on river systems and water systems in india fresh water right so yes. again like lesson on species we also have to look at it in a slightly larger habitat uh, perspective on conservation so can you yes. talk a little bit about why was your focus on riverine systems in india and and right. what graduate how graduate from there so in 2005 argyam the foundation that i set up started working on water with the mission safe sustainable water for all and all means not only humans but all living species right for this so while we focused a lot on human uh, you know sort of lifeline water drinking water for public health and just human well being we were very aware that it all ties back to rivers it ties back to landscapes and so it so we did a lot of work on groundwater management on wetland conservation on uh, drought proofing flood proofing with the amazing partners uh, that we have all over india and i must use this opportunity to say that in this whole field of conservation whether it's about water about land about air climate about conserve biodiversity there are so many very 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 good organizations that one is able to work with without that none of this would be possible so you cannot have imagine your forests right now in the summer we know what is going to happen to the forests without rain right how dry they get how how desperate the animals become so one real challenge for india is to manage its water resources better we can't produce more water even if we desalinate and i won't talk about the politics and the um, uh, sustainability of that but you, how does one manage as a country with the water that we have and i think we really need to think hard on this i think the forest department also has a role to play in helping uh, the public understand management of catchments so yeah through argyam we have been able to for the last 16 years do a lot of work on water because it is very 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 closely tied to biodiversity wildlife and human well-being obviously but but if if i can just ask a little bit a deeper question on that you know like you said forests are well established as forest department to look after we have x amount of percentage as protected areas and all that but if you look at water systems these are public areas you know it doesn't come under a single department 
it's yeah. it's a shared and resource between... 17 departments even at the union level yeah exactly right like the multiple departments and and in some sense we are heading towards a major water crisis in india i mean it's, it's one of those hidden things that people don't talk about people don't see it on surface i mean you're from bangalore we've seen in bangalore itself how the ground uh, water level has reduced drastically in the last two decades so as as citizens you know as collective how what is that we can do because with forests, at least we know that there is a forest department whose whose, whose mandate is to protect forests and animals. But with water, it's, it's our collective responsibility. And what is it as a as a common citizen that we can do to make a difference? Yeah, I think uh, as individuals, as community and samaj, as bazaar and as sarkar, all of us have a role to play in conservation of water. At the personal level, we all know that we need to reduce our water footprint. And even though sometimes you can feel, hey, how does it matter if I keep the tap running yeah, when I'm brushing my teeth? Huh? How does it matter actually? And perhaps it doesn't actually matter because eventually the system is a, a kind of an urban cycle. But uh, it's, it helps us to practice valuing water. When we remember to turn off the tap when we brush our teeth, if we, have a, if we are lucky enough to have running water that is, it helps us to understand and mindfully learn about water as a resource. Every single thing we do to drink less from a bottle, uh, not use bottles, or you know, just, just, just remember to, um, everything we do to put our mindfulness on the issue of water helps us all to be much more successful as a community. Every single thing that corporations do to make sure that inside their fence and in their supply chain, if they are being more efficient per unit of production when it comes to water, is helping everybody. And of course, the government has a mandate. It's a lifeline resource. The government has a mandate. And I must say the government right now has two huge missions. Um, on water and the Jal Shakti mission, hopefully at least lifeline water will be much more secure for people. We already have come a long way in the last few years, but yes, everyone has a role and we should not feel that everything we do is never enough. I think flipping that everything we do does contribute. If all of us can see that, uh, but, you know, without without making other people feel guilty or using too much judgment, right? Sometimes that happens too. So we have to be a little careful of that. See, more and more people also need to understand that water is hidden in everything, right? Water is hidden in this book, isn't it? Virtual water. God knows how many forests they needed to make this really marvelous but very thick book. So uh, to understand that water is hidden in everything, so everything we consume or use has a water footprint hidden in it. And sort of bringing out some of those stories, I think the younger generation understands some of these things more than we did when we were young. I mean, you are already much younger than me. So I think that consciousness is coming and people like us have to keep telling, keep telling those stories. And of course, try to be a little better as examples as well. My generation has a lot to account for, that's for sure. Don't you think that uh, overall, either your generation, our generation, or the, any, uh, the coming generation right now, we all have taken nature for granted. We didn't value what nature gives to us. And in a way, I feel that we have been disconnected with the nature, have, have not understood the importance of nature in our lives, because we have been so yeah. busy with our lives. And that's the that's reason there is a disconnect, complete disconnect. Uh, we believe that there are two different worlds, you know, nature world, which is a wildlife, and then there is a civilized world. And that disconnect has created humongous problems. So when we talk about climate change, I think, uh, I believe that this, this is one of the main reasons why this problem has become so huge. So I think that uh, over a bit of time, more and more people need to start getting that connection back with the nature. And yes. uh, organizations like yours or Nature in Focus or multiple other, other organizations have to play a huge role in building that connect. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree with you more. There's a lot of work to be done with, as I said, young people and especially urban people. Because look at our public spaces no? in urban India. Where is the opportunity to reconnect with nature even if you wanted to, right? We are, especially 2020 has allowed us a chance to reimagine public spaces, right? Because it was not the last pandemic. 
uh, nor was it the first. So it's given a real opportunity to rethink how we connect with nature. It, at the when there was such a deep lockdown, etc. You know, thirty percent of fossil fuel reduction happened for a short while. It may bounce yeah. back, but be, because people didn't use cars, people got to walk. People got to breathe cleaner air. So many people, and I disagree with those who think this is an elite issue. Now, people living in slums getting clean air is even more important than me getting clean air. So, it allowed us a chance to reimagine, and it is now up to civil society, um, up to academia, to keep that conversation going, so that we don't go back so quickly uh, to again being completely disconnected. So But don't you think that is happening, Rohini, right now? Because you know, at at when the lockdown was there, at that point of time, everybody was talking about nature is healing, you know, nature, nature is coming back, and now people have gone back to their normal lives. They have forgotten about nature again. Well, I I don't think so. Uh, okay. I meet so many young people who are so interested in looking for alternative futures because otherwise they're going to inherit a really terrible future scenario, and we are seeing it. Climate change is already here. I prefer to be uh, not foolishly optimistic, but I prefer to have hope and be realistic about the fact that when people see themselves in a real crisis because of abuse of water, abuse of land, abuse of carbon. they are going to just like people learn how to wear masks within one month right uh, not everybody but a lot of people and we always think humans can't change but we proved in 2020 that humans can change so i don't see why we should not hope that young people especially okay i keep saying young 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 because they are the ones who are going to be at the edge of that environmental crisis and i think they will be forced to innovate out of it and that might mean being less dependent on fossil fuels i also see in western countries and i may be wrong but i see the emergence of a post consumption generation that is less interested in buying their 17th t-shirt and their 45th uh, uh, i don't know in the old days we used to buy dvds but i don't know whatever um i see them more interested in other things that they if they had 100 rupees or earlier if they just gone out and bought some 10 10 or 15 of the same thing now they are looking consciously to spend that money in different ways that are less abusive of the planet so i feel if such a uh, such a leading generation makes itself visible others may follow great <clears throat> so just to talk because we are talking about the next generation one of your early initiatives has been with pratham books you know yes and, and, uh, it's been fascinating because i gifted all those books to my nephews who love it thank and, you thank you uh, and and because of those books you know i think they are fundamentally i mean they turn around to their parents and say that hey why are you doing this why are you not doing this you know so what is what else we can do? i mean like i think definitely we you know i like i said us is a lost generation you know we 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 not you not you you're much younger than me are you can't say that about yourself <laughs> you, well you still getting older a lot of work to do <laughs> but 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 for the next generation i mean i mean 30 years from now 50 years from now yes. how do we inspire our our children today to to you know start off i mean and and this time i'm not talking about urban elite who have access to everything i'm talking about across the board children uh, uh, the next generation how do we yeah. get on board with again not just save the tiger save the elephant but looking at environment as a whole you know from water to air pollution to everything right how do we get that generation on board yeah no i think in in school stuff matters a lot right we have now evs as a compulsory subject so how can we help to enrich what they learn there how can we give much more hands on practice uh, it doesn't matter where you are even if you live in an urban slum there is going to be stuff that is wild okay even if you live in a tribe if you are a tri a, a, a child of the um, jainu kurbas in uh, ka around kabini for example then you have it all around you and you need adults to help you make a little more sense of it you know apart from free exploring so what happens in schools matters what happens in your home matters a lot and then um of course uh the arts and culture 
that matters a lot. I mean, what you are doing, the documentation you are doing, the stories you all are carrying, uh, what our amazing documentary, wildlife documentary people are doing and so much creativity we can see now. Those stories are important. Performance, uh, performances are important, right? From Right from street theater to high whatever, uh, drama. So that's how you reach kids. That's, that is an ongoing, ongoing, ongoing effort. And now some interesting market interventions have come in, right? People seem to love outdoor camping, those who can afford it. And uh, they like to go out into the wild. Uh, tourism, forest tourism has increased so much. People are getting it, but these changes are slow. Our job is lager raho munna bhai. You keep telling your story, keep telling your story, find new audiences, keep sharing, and be as honest as you can about it. I think that's all we can do. Right. I mean, one of the things uh, you've seen while Karnataka, I think I think one of the biggest feedback is when children come back. I, so many children have written to us saying that we didn't know Karnataka so much, and we always yes. think about you, but. They want to go see the crabs and the dracos and things like that. So exactly. You have unlocked, once you unlock these treasures to people, no, then they yeah. want to discover it themselves. So that's why I said your storytelling is such an important part of, uh, you know, sensitizing the next generation. Right. right. Uh, Rohit, do you want to continue? Or? Yeah, just, just one point, which I would like to really ask that as we are talking about the next generation, uh, but would you like to give some three or four different uh, points or things which they can do to make sure that we are able to conserve what we have? We are able to uh, better the the current status of the environment or the earth. Say like a three-pointed agenda kind of a thing which we can drive it and the whole world can drive that. Yeah. Uh, well, I tend to tell young people to stay curious, right? which means always keep your mind open and acquire new knowledge about how we are all so interdependent, okay? From the ants and the spiders to all the germs, bacteria on our skins, right? Remain curious about that. Huh? Secondly, I would say remain connected. Once you have that curiosity, you will develop more understanding. So second thing I would say is remain more connected to the issues that you have understood. And I mean that in, uh, see, these are all economic, social, political issues of the environment. Don't hesitate to connect yourself to those issues. If it means understanding laws, how they affect you, how they affect your, the, the spaces around you, the habitats around you, stay connected. And thirdly, I would say, once you have become curious, once you have stayed connected, then remain committed because this is a long journey. We need perseverance, right? We need not to be uh, disappointed by certain things that two or three things that we step back, but we have to keep walking to go forward. This is right now the only planet we have to inhabit. Uh, we know that we need to heal it, to regenerate it, and by doing that, we regenerate ourselves. So stay curious, stay connected, and stay committed. Um, those are the three things I would like to say to people. That's perfect, just perfect. Because this is very important for people to understand what they can do. Uh, even when you talk about the children, they need to know what they can do with. So that's a larger problem what everybody faces, that there are so many people who love nature. They would like to contribute. They would like to do something about it. They just do not know what to do. So that what to do is a very, very important part of it. And uh, the message you have passed on. Uh, sorry, there are lots of organizations who ever just connect to one issue, one organization. Take one step and that step will lead you to the next step and the next step. And also in the process, please everybody have lots of fun because it is fun. That wonder, you can rediscover wonder by reconnecting uh, with our environment, right? So it's also a lot of fun and joy and uh, gives absolute uh, fulfillment to the heart and the head. Awesome. Great. One last thing, Rohini, is, I mean, again, just coming back to your philanthropy efforts, you've been instrumental in funding a lot of uh, non-NGOs like A3, NCF, and, and a whole bunch and of organizations. A3, Nature Conservation Foundation, Dakshin, I've forgotten all the many other. Of course. And you know that, I mean, they are very good friends uh, in all these organizations yeah. and they are instrumental in, in understanding and trying to come up with solutions for 
environment, uh, saving an environment. Now, if I look back in India in philanthropy, you're probably the number one when it comes to uh, funding in the, in the environment space. So, so, oh, that I'm not uh, at number... all sure. No, no, no. There are lots of others. So that's not true. So let's not go there. But yeah, sure, uh, sure. But if I'm uh, an enthusiast, we can say that much. Yeah. Then. So what's your message for, I mean, other people, big, big uh, industrialists in India? Because we really do need money at the end of the day. These organizations do need money and without that, nothing moves You know, at the end of the day. Uh, yeah. and, and of course, there are a lot of people uh, who do a lot of donate, but of course, a lot of it focus on education and uh, healthcare and system, which is very important, of course. But yeah. but how do we get more people to fund and environment causes and, and these grassroots organizations? Yeah, thank you, Kalyan. I think that's a good and important question because, uh, you know, um, See, I now know a lot of the environmental organizations in India. And I also know, and I'm going to be frank here, um, there are a lot of hardcore positions that organizations can take, okay? Uh, so, um, sometimes we see, we see a lot of clash among environmentalist organizations on several issues, right? And that sometimes becomes public. For example, um, one of the big issues we know is some people believe we can only conserve our forests if we remove human beings from that. And some people believe there's no way we can conserve our forests if you don't have human eyes watching, right? So, um, or being part of it because we are part of nature. Without commenting on my position on that issue, the point I'm trying to make is the civil society organizations working with the environment need to come to some kind of common minimum platform where you can tell your stories um, without, without any bitter battles so that those stories reach the people who have capital that they want to put into this. There are a lot of people, but they get confused about what issues to support and how, right? So I think some platform is necessary for y'all, all of y'all to think about, because I know a lot of the people who will be watching this will be in that space. What can y'all think of to come together so that when philanthropists gather, maybe that organization and this organization, we can create some bridges. We can bring some stories, right? I think that's very important. I think for many years, right, foreign organizations were funding this space to some extent. And I'm very glad they did and we thank them a lot. It is now time to join Indian philanthropic capital, right? And for that, we must make sure that we don't take, uh, that we don't hesitate to reach out to the Indian wealthy. Okay, we have to reach out to them uh, without putting ideological barriers over our eyes. Can we do that? Can we open ourselves up to tell stories to those who really want to do something, but may not have connected all the dots, right? All of us in our, our, our uh, or each one of us is on their her own evolutionary path. I think the time has come to reach out, to create spaces, to bring your stories to the, to the wealthy of this country who want to be more philanthropic in the environment space. And I hope all of you will start your internal dialogues on this. And in whatever way I can help, I'll be happy to help. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Rani. Thanks for your insights. It was a Thank lovely so having much. a chat with you. Thank you for giving us a time. So I uh, hope it was at all useful. Thank you for the opportunity and hope Nature and Focus meets physically next time and I'm coming. Course, course, Surely, we would love to see you there. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ravana.